right, ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be our next video on evolution. We're going to look at who influenced Charles Darwin. So let's get started on our next video. So the question that I'm going to pose for you right now is how do structures like this form? So here's a picture of Sedona, Arizona. And these are actually all pictures that I've taken um, through some of my travels out west. Here we have a picture of Grand Canyon National Park. This is a slot canyon in Moab. And then over here we have another slot canyon in Zion National Park. Well, how do these structures like this form? And how long does it take for structures like this to form? And Lyle is a scientist that we're going to look at. And he proposed that gradual geological processes have shaped the Earth's surface, inferring that the Earth must be far older than most people believed. Now, Lyle is a scientist who really makes Darwin question how old the Earth really is and really influences his um, evolutionary uh, thought process. So what we're going to do is go into uh, the scientists and the individuals who really influenced Darwin, and we're going to go through and look at them in more detail. Charles Darwin is influenced mainly by a few of these people that we've gone through and talked about. Now, Lamarck went through and he proposed the idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics. And we'll look at this in a little bit more detail, but this thought process initially sparked the idea of evolution in the scientific community, but it was shown to actually be wrong and natural selection was uh, proven to be correct. Now, Lyle went through and proposed that geological features of the Earth are much older than previously thought, which went through and proposed that the world is much older than people initially thought. Now, Malthus was actually an economist, and he proposed the idea that resources and population size are related. And this went through and made Charles Darwin think about resources, especially when going through and talking about human and predator-prey populations. Now, lastly, Darwin was influenced by his grandfather, Aramis Darwin, and he fostered the idea initially in Darwin's mind and inspired him to go through and complete this scientific journey that eventually led to the origin of species. So if we look at Charles Darwin's family, well, his father is Robert Darwin and his mother is Emma Darwin. Now, they go through and they give birth to Charles. And Charles on his mother's side, well, they're actually from the famous Wedgwood family. And the Wedgwood family was a really wealthy, famous family for creating pottery. They were the Wedgwood and Sons Pottery Company. And on Darwin's father's side, we have Aramis Darwin, who was also another famous scholar. Now, Aramis was a naturalist and formulated the first theories of evolution in a book called Zoonomia, or in another book that he went through and completed this was The Law of Organic Life. Now, Aramis did not come up with the idea of natural selection. That is something that Darwin came up with on his own. However, he discusses all of these theories that he had with Charles when Charles was a child, and this really solidified the thought process in which would become the origin of species. So Darwin really was influenced by his grandfather, who initially proposed this idea of evolution to him, and then Darwin went out on the Beagle and really went through and explored and gathered the evidence for this, and then came up with the idea of natural selection. Now, if we look at Lamarck, Lamarck went through and he was a French naturalist and he was uh, one of the first scientists to propose that species change over time. So again, we're going back to our giraffes. How did the giraffes get their long necks? Well, Lamarck is going to say inheritance of acquired characteristics and he's going to say the traits of an organism develop during its own lifetime and cannot be passed on to the offspring. So if we compare what Lamarck and Darwin went through and proposed, well, Lamarck is basically saying that as the, the giraffe's population, all of them start off very small. And eventually they start stretching their necks just a little bit, and they go to the second uh, set of giraffes. And as they go through and stretch their necks, you know, all of the individuals are surviving and these mutations are getting passed on. And as they stretch those necks, they're going to get taller over time. We know that this is not correct. Darwin went through and proposed the idea of natural selection in which the fit individuals within the population go through and reproduce. So the individuals who are not as fit will not reproduce and will potentially die. And therefore the genes and the mutations that survive are the ones that are going to be most well adapted or most fit for that environment. And this results in the change over generations and over time resulting in 
in this case the long necks for the giraffe or whatever evolutionary advantage is best for that environment. So Lamarck went through and kind of proposed this idea, but the mechanism behind it was incorrect. Now Lyle went through and he was a geologist and Darwin really went through and read his book, The Principles of Geology, and took this with him on the Beagle. So as Darwin is on the Beagle, he's going through, taking notes and reading this book. And Lyle argued that gradual geological processes have gradually shaped the Earth's surface. So what we see is the Earth is a lot older than what was previously thought. Individuals only thought the Earth was maybe about four to 6,000 years old. And these processes that happen in geology take millions and millions of years. If we look at the image of Capitol Reef, these structures took millions of years to form. Now, because of this, what we can infer is that, well, if the Earth is older than we thought it was, or what scientists thought it was previously, well, this gives plenty of time for evolution to occur after many, many, many generations. So this really helps influence and give more evidence to the theory of evolution. Now, Malthus was an English economist, and he wrote an essay titled On Population. And what he went through and proposed, and he said, is that human populations grow faster than the resources they depend on. And when populations become too large, famine and disease break out. So human populations are going to depend on these resources. And if we were to go through and graph this, we could see population and time. Well, over time, it's going to grow exponentially until we hit a capacity where the resources are not there to support the entire population. And when we start looking at carrying capacity and start looking at how populations grow, this is really the fundamental idea that went through and helped solidify evolution again in Darwin's mind. But what Malthus went through and proposed as an economist is what we look at today in terms of population ecology and how we view how the environment influences the evolution of individuals within a species. Now, another individual that was really important for us to talk about is Alfred Russell Wallace. And have you ever heard the term great minds think alike? Well, Alfred Russell Wallace was alive the same time that Darwin was alive. And around the same time that Darwin was working on his research, Wallace published a theory basically independently stating the theory of evolution. Now what this does is it forces Darwin to kind of hurry up and publish his origin of species. And it really helps solidify the fact that, well, it's not just Darwin that's going through and thinking about this process. There are other scientists within this field who are also going through finding similar evidence all around the world and showing that evolution went through and is occurring. So as we go through and look at this, we can see it was not just Darwin who was proposing these ideas at the time. We also have Wallace. And this really helped Darwin publish his book, but also gave him the moral support that he needed to show that his ideas were in fact correct. Now there's one more thing I want to go through and talk about in this video, and it's called artificial selection. Darwin was also aware that humans could breed plants and animals to have useful traits. Now, if we think about artificial selection here, this is the process by which selecting which animals were allowed to reproduce. And this is influenced by humans. And this can really influence an organism's trait. So if we go through and look at the wolf here, well, all dogs are common descendants from the wolf. And we can see that wolves and dogs at some point in Siberia went through and they speciated or they separated. And from this, what we get are all of these individual dogs that we see. So we have the Sheltie, we have the Dachshund, we have the Chihuahua, we have Dalmatians, we also have Rottweilers or Dobermans here. And we can see that we have all of these different morphological changes and dogs that look very, very different. Now, as we look at this, what we see is each of these dogs has been bred for a specific purpose. Now, Shelties were originally bred as herding dogs and small enough dogs that could be carried on horseback. Now, Dobermans, it's unclear as to what their original purpose, but it's generally thought that Dobermans were first bred in the 1880s by Carl Frederick Lewis, and he was in Germany. And he was a tax collector, and he wanted to go through and breed dogs that would be ideal for protecting him. So he went through and bred these very, very tall, heavy-footed, muscular dogs. 
Now, Dalmatians were originally bred as a war dog, but then they turned into mascot and shepherd dogs. And then they were eventually used as vermin, hound dogs, and kind of guard dogs, especially in circuses and firehouses. So what we can see with artificial selection is humans, humans can kind of be like the environment and they can artificially select for it. They can put pressure on certain traits, pick and choose specific animals that go through and breed with other specific animals that exhibit these traits. This occurs in both plants and animals. And then as a result, you can breed out these different morphological changes within the organisms. Now, here's the thing. You have to keep in mind that some of these dogs or some of these organisms may not survive without human protection and human help. So it's important to note here that in the wild, dogs are going to exist more in this morphological form of a wolf. But because humans went through and wanted specific things out of these breeds, and because they're going through and taking care of these organisms, what we see are these different traits that get selected for amongst these different organisms. All right, so did you guys learn? Well, did you learn a couple of things? Did you guys learn in detail of how Charles Darwin was influenced? Did you guys learn again in more detail about the people who went through and influenced him and the scientific discoveries that they made? And then did you guys learn about the process of artificial selection? This is going to be the end of the video. I will see you all in class tomorrow.